Thank you. It's nice. Come back this afternoon and hear, hear more at 530. After I preached with the shawl last Friday night, someone gave me one. And so I said, okay, I'll wear it. So here I promise that I would wear it. What do you need? I'm okay. Someone uh, mentioned that we hadn't uh, mentioned the people that have passed away in our church. It's in the bulletin. The funeral, Kevin Ebnett, who's up here, his mother passed away last Saturday morning early before Easter services. That service is this coming Thursday, I think at 10 o'clock, right, right here. The other one is Bertie Krell, who's just been uh, really a lifelong member of our church, the Krell dynasty for several generations, and just had a stroke and went down and down until she was gone. So that turned what the time is, the day is wrong in the bulletin. It's not April 16, it's April 23. So if you could have that right, it'll be uh, 4 o'clock upstairs. But they've asked me to say a special prayer for Ray Kaysen. Ray is one of our heart and soul people out at the front door at the uh, concierge desk often. And he's really had a tough uh, week and a half and uh, had a test on his heart this week, and he's going to have to have heart surgery. They will take the heart out and do whatever they do to clean it up and take things, make things right and then put it back in. It's a big deal. You can just hear that description. So uh, would you remember Ray? But we'd like to just pray right now for our church, but also for Ray and Chris. Would you bow our heads for prayer? And the Father in heaven, this is... Uh, what a church does. These are people that are precious to us. So we pray for Kevin and Donna and their family. They've cared for their mother and mother-in-law for a long time. It's not been easy, and now mother is gone. We pray a blessing on that family and on the service that's coming this week. For Bertie Krell, Father, this lady, we have loved her. She has been a saint, always beautiful, into her late 80s. A great heart, her husband passed away before I came, taught in our school for so long. Many, many people remember the crowds. John is up here taping our services every week, every week, every week. And now the mother is gone. So we just pray for John and Bill and the whole family and bless that uh, situation. But now in a special way, we want to bring our own Ray and Chris to you. I went to, that's how I first visited Ray, was in the hospital when he had heart trouble years ago. Hadn't been in our church for 30 years. Began to drive up, been driving 45 minutes each way for years. We love these people. They've been giving everything they have to serve and feed homeless every Sabbath. Now they can't do it. He's got a real scary situation. So we pray a blessing on Ray and the medical people that will do this procedure. It sounds impossible, but that's what they do. And we pray you will give those people who do that wisdom and steady their hands and may they do their very best for our friend and brother. And may he come out of that with his heart working the way it's supposed to and give him many more years to serve you here and the homeless, Father. So bless them. And anyone else who needs a special care of your blessing today, we pray that you would bless them. May they have what they need because that's what you have promised. And may our worship be a blessing to your heart today as we dream and talk about what heaven means to us as Seventh-day Adventists. Today we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I went, uh, Gerald and I went to a funeral a couple weeks ago. Conference president up at uh, Southern California Conference until just a few months ago. Retired at 73, ready to have retirement with his wife and grandchildren and the family. Moved back east to be with them. Ten days later in the hospital, they found uh, pancreatic cancer, and a few months later, he's gone. So I find myself now, when I read about something and I look at the age, then I subtract my age, and I do the difference. 73, 62, 11, and the number is getting smaller all the time. And you only have so much time. That's what it is in our world. How did I get to this place? 
The old joke's been around, boy, a long, long time. I think I used it the first day of last year, 20-some years ago. The old joke is that good news, bad news. The good news is they come to the pastor and the angel says, your prayers have been answered. There is golf in heaven. And every course is perfect and the grass is perfect and uh, the weather is perfect and you only play with nice people and you never go in the trees or in the water. The bad news is you're playing next Sunday. <laughs> Did you get it? It's an old story about the marbles. The man was listening to the radio, just enjoying his uh, Sunday morning, got his coffee and his newspaper. Listening to the radio, and an older man, 75 years old, was talking on the radio. The young man who was interviewing him was working so hard that he had just missed his daughter's dance recital. So this older man, he said, uh, just be careful with that. He said, I figured out at one time that uh, if you live 75 years, that's 4,000, give or take, Sundays in your life. He said, I was 55 when I figured this out, so I, fi I only had 1,000 Sundays yet to go. So I went down, it took me three toy stores, I got 1,000 marbles, and I put them in a jar. And every Sunday, I throw away a marble. And it just made me be careful about my priorities and what's important and what do you use your, your time off to do and to be with. And he said, I threw away the last marble today. It's gone. 75. Next week I live on borrowed time. The man was listening on the radio. He got up and went into the house and he said, honey, let's go out to eat, you and the kids. And she said, what? What's going on? He said, well, just we haven't done much together for a while. But on the way, we need to stop at a toy store. I need to get me some marbles. <laughs> Time running out. But Jesus comes and he says the night before he dies, his time was running out, but he's trying to say, you're going to hear that I died. You're going to see me die, but time has not run out for me. And then he gives this famous passage. Can we put the text on the screen? Would you say it with me? From the King James, John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'll take you to be with me. That where I am, there you may be also. You believe it? And the question is, what are you going to do with that thousand years? Jesus says, it may look as if your marbles are running out, your time is about done. But I am telling you, I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you more time. I'm going to give you a thousand years. But you really want to go? What are they going to do with the thousand years? You ever thought about uh, what it must be like to be a recruiter for the priests and nuns for the Catholic Church? So you go to the uh, high schools and you put up a little booth and you have your brochures and here comes an 18-year-old senior and you hand him a brochure and you say, hey, you want to serve Christ for the rest of your life, be a priest or a nun? And they say, well, what do I have to do? Well, first of all, it means you will be celibate. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you will, you will never get married. You will never make love. You will never have children. How do they get people to do this? And it means you will wear black robes for the rest of your life. If you're a nun, no one will ever see your hair again. And you will spend all day reading ancient books and singing uh, 15th century Gregorian chants. And you will spend a lot of your days fasting and praying, on kneeling on your knees. How do they get people to sign up? 
But if you think about it, that's how we have sold heaven to most people. You're going to wear white robes for the rest of your eternity. You're going to lose your individuality. You're not going to be able to do any of the things that you like down here. You're going to be spending all your time sitting on clouds playing harps or standing on a sea of glass singing hallelujah. Or here's this. God is outside of time and you are outside of time. So we spend the rest of eternity just sitting there staring at each other, us and God. I had a focus group one time with some college kids of us here on this, and they said, sure seems to be an awful lot in the Bible about we're going to be doing a lot of gardening in heaven. I hate gardening. <laughs> one faculty said, no, you're not going to be gardening. You're going to be studying. You're going to be reading and thinking and talking. For... We're going to be doing classes and homework for the rest of a thousand years. <laughs> one junior high choir teacher, I heard a pastor tell this story. He said, I was in eighth grade. Our junior high choir teacher was so irritated with us, our, us boys, you know, we're not singing. We don't want to be in junior high choir. She finally just lost it and said, you better be doing what I'm telling you here because if you have any plans on going to heaven, this is what we're going to be doing all the time, every day, forever. <laughs> Mark Twain, I, you can go read it online, Mark Twain became pretty much an atheist in his life, and he made fun of heaven, and he said, all the things you'd like to do, smoking, drinking, sleeping around, all the partying, all those are taken away. All the things you hate doing, gardening, studying, church, religion, you do that every day forever. Who wants to go? See, no wonder. You ask young people, okay, they want to go to heaven, but, but not now. Let me experience everything that I want to experience here first. After I've experienced it all and I've done my thing, then okay, okay, then I'll go. But not now, tomorrow, later, not now. My brother worked for the Adventist Media Center out at Simi Valley. I happened to be out there for a meeting with Faith for Today with my friends Dwight and Greg Nelson and some others. Somehow in the middle of that board meeting, they got a phone call, and they said, Pastor Dan, it's for you. I said, how did anybody know I was here? How did they find me here? And the secretary of my church got on the phone. They said, your dad has been hit in a hit-and-run accident. That's all they knew. My brother and I were 100 miles away. We got in the car, began to drive, trying to call my mother, trying to call my brother, call the hospital. He was in tests and all that, unconscious. Every mile is torture. What are we going to find when we get there? We'll never, we'll never get over. Going to the red light by Riverside Community Hospital and parking, walking in the door and find my brother is there. How is he? Unconscious. Truck had hit him while he was walking on a sidewalk. Anyway, to make a long story short, he passed away that night, never woke up. That was on a Wednesday. We had Sabbath coming. My staff and everyone said to me, Pastor Dan, let someone else preach. You have too much stress. I don't know why, but I wanted to preach. Didn't have much time. Friday afternoon, I sat down and worked on a sermon. And people told me later, they were all sitting by the radio or at church and wanted to hear what would Pastor Dan say about his own father. And I wrote a sermon on uh, heaven looks pretty good to us today. Amen? Amen. Somehow, even though I'm an Adventist preacher, heaven is a big part of me. Somehow now it's your father. If I ever want to see him again, there has to be a heaven. And I preached on that Sabbath. My father was a saint, a wonderful person, not perfect for sure, but a great, great man. 1,200 people came to the funeral last year. I never even got to the reception. As soon as I got off the platform, there was a line of people to tell me stories. Your dad did this for me. Your dad stopped and did. Your dad went to the jail. Yeah, your dad, your dad, your dad. Great stories. We told some of the fun stuff. I told about how he took us uh, to take the dog to the vet. We got to the vet. We didn't have the dog. Talked about a uh, time I went golfing with him in Bangkok, and I was standing basically to the side of him, maybe a little bit of him, not very much, and somehow he hit the ball and hit me. 
physically impossible to do that. He just was a unique human being. He would be in the car driving, and we'd be out in the middle of Thailand, and he would be different car race, race car drivers, you know, and we'd have races with all these people. Just, he just was fun. Racing through airports, because we were always late to all the airports. Someone gave him a hairpiece. He wore a hairpiece for a week. You can guess what his hairstyle was. And we went uh, swimming at the Andrews University pool when he was at a seminary there. We were at school. And he dove in with that hairpiece, and when it came back up, the hairpiece was floating over there on the pool. <laughs> he never wore it again. <laughs> Nuts to that. I told about being a missionary in Thailand, riding on top of a bus. It's easier up there with the chickens and the pigs. And the bus went over a little two-board bridge, and the bus went over, and my father went flying, and he went over the ra wood railing and just ripped his backside. I'll never forget it. My dad showed me in the shower the big gashes. He was a great missionary. Heaven looks pretty good to us today. And so, Gerald and I would like to preach a series for a month on Revelation, on heaven. Amen? Maybe you think you'll know, and maybe you won't hear a single thing new. I don't know. But maybe it's just important to hear it again, what we believe and where we are going. So this week, Old Testament, Revelation, heaven. Next week, New Testament. Gerald will do while I'm gone. What are we going to do in heaven? We'll deal with other religions in heaven. Heaven and hell, just cover the subject the best we can. So I've gone, gone through the Bible and tried to think in the Old Testament only. What does it say about heaven? Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. It's just something that God has put within us. That when we come to a thing like my father dying, it's just not enough. 72 years with him. I'm glad he didn't have to have all the other you know, tubes and hoses and ICUs and all the rest, but I would like to have had 10 or 15 more years. My mother's 14 years a widow now every weekend by herself, every day. We all have this longing. This cannot be enough. There has to be more. Every religion around the world, all those kids that died in D-Day, we went to that cemetery this, week, this year. How can you die at 19 or 20? The whole life there. There's got to be more. That's why they have a cross there, hoping the cross will give them more. You go to Egypt, pyramids, mummies. I've been to all the mummies in the Cairo Museum. They have on all the walls of all those palaces down in Egypt, these bark, these, it's called a boat, it's called a bark. And the bark stands for the transition, the vehicle that will take you to the other world. That's why they buried them in those tombs and sealed them so your spirit wouldn't leave because if the spirit was released, then you would not make it to the other side. They would have servants paid to bring food there so that they would have life on the other side. That's why all that gold stuff was in King Tut's tomb so he would have those things in the next life. They spent most of their life preparing for the next life. I grew up in Thailand in Buddha's funerals. I have sat there. We have a picture of it with the priest sitting there and people every few minutes going up there and giving more gifts to the Buddhist priest. Why are they giving gifts to the priest? They're hoping the priest will pray the right prayer so that the person who died will not go to hell but somehow advance with the next life. Everybody wants more. Nobody wants to say, this is all I'm going to get. God has put this longing into us. C.S. Lewis uses it as one of the great arguments for God and heaven. The fact that all around the world, every single culture, every religion has this longing for something after death. This nostalgic sense that there is a past somewhere that I want to get back to that. A garden or a, a peaceful place where I will live without stress, without rules, without complications, where everything is easy and everything is perfect and all my senses are satisfied. We all have this longing. You want to retire, you want to go to Hawaii, you want to have a vacation. It's all from that same desire. And C.S. Lewis says, just the fact that we all have this longing is a evidence that there is such a place. He said, if you're 
the fact that you have uh, hunger is proof because there is a thing as food. The fact that you have a sexual urge for making love and being married, there is such a thing. And he says, because you have this longing for this other life in this perfect world, it's pretty good evidence that there is such a place. And we all want to be there. That someday, he said, we will walk into our mansion in heaven and we will say, oh, this is what I've been looking for all my life. Everything else, no matter what mansion you have today, is like camping and primitive compared to that sense of at home. This is where I belong. This is where I was supposed to be all along. We were pretty primitive down there in Mexico, camping in the dirt, little porta potties, little fence around some barrels of cold water. But that's how even the highest people live today compared to what we will have in heaven someday. There are at least three versions of this story. I think uh, you probably have heard all these. Dwight used this in the Net 98 sermon about the goose. One of these goose uh, somehow got lost from the rest of the flock, ended up with a group of chickens, thought it was a chicken, scratching for worms with the chickens. One day geese were flying over and uh, one geese came down goose and said, uh, what are you doing? You were not a chicken. You're a goose like me. You were made to fly. And he showed him how to beat the wings. And that goose began to fly and became what it was meant to be. You were not a chicken. There's an Indian parable about a lion cub that uh, got lost from his mother. The mother died. He was with a group of goats. That's all he knew. He was a goat like the other goats, eating grass. When all of a sudden an old lion came by and said, eating grass? What are you doing? Took him over to the pond. Look at your face. You are not a goat. You are a lion. You are not supposed to be eating grass. You are a lion. And he let out a roar. And the little one let out a roar and realized it was a lion. <laughs> or the seal who was in a mud puddle in the middle of the desert. Had a little tree of shade, other animals. But at night, it would climb up on a rock and it would smell the breeze of the sea coming. And it would dream about being in the sea and in the water with all the other seals. And he would wake up in the morning in a mud puddle. And he said to the other animals, I'm going to go to the sea. And the owl said, no, no, there is no sea. That's the sea. Oh, I don't think this mud puddle is the sea. I don't think I was made for this. No, that's it. There began to be a windstorm and the seal put his head uh, no flippers over his eyes to block the sand. For 40 days the wind blew and all the leaves were gone. And when he kept, opened up his eyes, all his shade was gone. And the water was gone from the mud puddle. And he looked and he said, I don't think I was supposed to be like this. And he began to walk slowly as a seal across the desert. And the owl said, where are you going? He said, I am going to the ocean. I was not made for this. This mud puddle is not what I am made for. And we believe you and I were not made for here. We were made for heaven. We are strangers and aliens here. Our citizenship is in heaven, Hebrews says. We're made for God. And that's why we all have this longing that this is not good enough. There's something better. Amen? Amen. What else does the Bible say? Going through heaven in the Old Testament. I had some fun with this. I cannot read a thousand pages for sure, but I... Try to do a survey. The first idea is the word up. God comes down in Exodus 3, verse 8, and he says, I have heard your cry, and I have come down to rescue you. Nebuchadnezzar, after his seven years eating grass, he says, I looked up towards heaven. Jacob, when he was lying with his head on a pillow on the rock, and he had a dream. He saw angels going from here to heaven. God has somehow chosen to go. I don't know where up is. Not that important, maybe. But the idea that there was a heaven. Jesus, when he left, he went up. He says when the dead in Christ will rise, they will rise up to go be with Christ. It's someplace above us, different from us, up. Then there is, uh, the next word is better. Abraham, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, he lived in tents, longing for a better country, a heavenly one whose builder and maker is God. It's the New Testament, 
but it's about Abraham. So way back then, Abraham was already not satisfied. He's rich. But he says, I'm looking for something that is better than what I have. Moses is in a palace ready to be the next king of Egypt. And he decides that it would be a greater value to be with God than to be king of Egypt. It's better. Even if you are Bill Gates, even if you have a mansion, if you are Donald Trump with your house on the beach in Florida, you can have a private jet, you can have everything you can possibly imagine. The Bible says heaven is a thousand times better than that. And David says in the Psalms, one day, just one day, as a doorman in heaven is better than a thousand days down here with everyone else. It's up and it's better. Number three, it's longer. It says in Hebrews 11, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God then enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. It may seem 70, 80, 90 years here is a long time. But I think everyone who is older will now say time is going faster. Have you noticed that? And when you get to the end and all of a sudden you're facing the end, uh, it's not long enough. And the Bible says heaven will be longer, a thousand years and forever. And Pascal's wager is this, that somehow, even if we cannot prove God, we none of us can go to heaven, we can't prove Jesus rose from the grave, we can't prove any of it. But just on the chance that there is a chance that I can live forever and see my Father and do this all again and be with God face to face for a thousand years plus forever, it is worth it. There is nothing you can gain in the world here. No matter how much partying you might do, there is no trade-off worth it to give up a chance that you might have forever with God and with your loved ones. He said, just do it because the upside is more than the downside. Number four, the Old Testament makes it clear not all are going to go. The Bible's pretty clear that people think that somehow God is so loving and so kind and gracious, He is going to find a way to get everybody in. It's called universalism. And there's a growing movement of that in America today. Some key books about it. There are a whole denomination. That's all they teach is universalism. God is going to find a way. He'll keep giving you chances until He gets everybody. You have to be insane to reject it. Some of that's true. But the book of Daniel is very, very clear. He says, your people... Everyone whose name is in the book will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. It's not going to be all. You have to choose. But probably the book that has the most about heaven in the Old Testament is the Psalms. Can't bring it all to you. I'm just going to bring the one. Psalm 23. How many people have had Psalm 23 at a funeral? Getting on the boats to go over in World War II, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy here. Yes, God will bless you here, but there's also some more. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Number one, it's after death, after the valley of the shadow of death. Number two, I will dwell in the house, in my father's house. I went to prepare a place. I will be with the Lord. How long? Forever. It's in the Old Testament. Forever. Number five is that it's individualized. You have to follow this carefully now. Many people have gotten the idea that somehow heaven flattens out everybody's personality. We will be all alike. I have a picture of it there. You're all the same. No one knows who you are anymore. You're all like the angels. You're all wearing exactly the same white robe. No one knows who each other is. Your family might be there. You don't know who they are. We will be exactly the same. Everything else, you have lost your individuality. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible uses different imagery. It uses, for the Old Testament, it uses farming. It was an agrarian society. 
And so the ultimate was to be your own house and to be vineyards and farm and to be able to get the crops because they were mostly slaves. You worked to give the crop to someone else. You rented the house. And so it described heaven and what would be the ideal for that time. You go to the New Testament. It doesn't talk about farming and gardening and vineyards anymore. It talks about cities. The city whose builder and maker is God. Heaven is going to be a city, because that was what society was. What's the point? What would God say to you today? He would describe heaven to you in terms of whatever you long for, what your bucket list is down here in this world today. God will make heaven exactly tailored to you. Whatever you're looking for, what you want to do, what you are longing for, you will walk in. It will feel like it fits you exactly. They asked in an article the other day, Christianity Today, will there be motorcycles in heaven? Where we were last night, there were all these motorcycles. I don't know if there will be motorcycles in heaven, Mac. But whatever you get out of motorcycle riding, he will give you that times a thousand. Whatever you get out of video games, I don't know if there will be video games in heaven, but whatever you like about video games, God will give you that pleasure in heaven times a thousand. Whatever you have here, whatever you like, whatever would be the ideal world, the mansion on the beach in Hawaii, whatever it is, that's what it will be to you. And you will feel like, this, this is exactly what I would wish I could have. Heaven is individualized to each person. Amen? Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight thyself in the Lord, he will grant you the desires of your heart. Number six is peace. Everywhere in the Old Testament, there is this metaphor for war. And at the end of the war, then God comes in and he wins the battle, and then there is 40 years of peace. Peace. I will fight the battle. I will give you peace. I will give you peace. And it is a metaphor for what heaven will be someday. And all of the Old Testament has this sort of theme. And if you will just obey me, I will do this for you. I will make you the head and not the tail, the head top and not the bottom. And then the great chapters in Isaiah chapter 35. He said, if you'll just follow me, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap as a deer, the tongue of the dumb will sing, and the desert will bloom as a rose. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return with songs and everlasting joy, and sorrow and sighing shall die away. Great picture of heaven and the new earth. Sin is gone. War is over. Everything is the way it was supposed to be. I am not an expert on 007 James Bond movies, all right? Please, don't misunderstand. But I know enough to know this basic theme is that in every movie of these James Bond series, the books or movies, the world is going to hell. Some guy's making all the gold radioactive or some other terrible thing, nuclear bomb, something. And James Bond is the only one who evidently is supposed to be able to solve it. And they come in, here's your thing you have to do. And he goes, and he's all over car chases and boat chases and craziness is going on. At the end of the movie, the last three minutes, there's always this moment when the war is over, all the bad guys are gone, the world is safe again, and all of a sudden you can't find James Bond because he's out on a sailboat somewhere with the most beautiful girl you've ever seen. <laughs> and there's peace until the next movie starts and the world's going to hell again. But the message of the Bible is someday the cycle is going to be done, and God is going to finish the war of the great controversy, and God is going to win that war, and then there will be peace. And there will be the moment. And those two minutes at the end of every movie where James Bond lives at peace is a type and a microcosm of the thousand years that we will have peace with God. The Bible calls it shalom, where there's nothing wrong and nothing is missing. In fact, the Bible uses the whole idea of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. At the end of the year, they would have this moment. All the sin has now come to the sanctuary. And then they line the whole camp up, and they would put all the sins from the, from the tabernacle, put it on that goat. Then they would lead that goat out into the wilderness. We've done it here. We've done it all over the world. Did it in India a few weeks ago. And we tell everybody, you put your sins on this goat now. Then we lead that goat out, and then we have the whole crowd stand and cheer. And so for the Jews, every year there was this day that was a sign of the end of the world. 
when there would be this day when we would go to heaven and all the sins would be gone and there would be shalom. Nothing wrong, nothing missing. Amen? Finally, there is the idea of home. All the way through the Bible, there's the idea of home. We were supposed to be in heaven. We're going to return home. There was a Garden of Eden that God made this perfect, incredible place, and we're all supposed to get back to that home. What can we do to get home? The prodigal son, get home. Have a party. Bring you home. So heaven will be this sense of home where we belong, where we were made to be there. Let me finish with a story from this week. We went up, my brothers and I, to listen to a pastor speak up on Thursday, a Monday in Ventura, a couple hundred pastors there. Pastor preached a two-point sermon. Number one, accept God's love. Number two, love others. Simple. Works for North American Division, Hispanic, lived in New York, great story preacher. And he told a story about his little boy, three years old, he said. Now he's a teenager, three years old. It was his birthday. The father went to Toys R Us and wanted to get him something. So I said, he went to Toys R Us and he knew his son wanted this car. The problem was there were small versions and medium versions and big versions. Big one, $99.95. Well, for a pastor, it was a lot of money, $95 for one car. But then, well, you know, make him happy. Walked out of there with the 99.95 version, a big car. Wrapped it all up, came in, birthday morning, came to a little boy's bedroom, saying happy birthday to him. Where's my present? Where's my present? Brought the present, opened it up, and he said, I was expecting thank you and hugs and kisses and Papa, I love you, thank you. Instead, I got stomped his foot. Papa's too big. You got one that's too big. I'm just little. How can I play with this one so big? The father began to get mad. I paid $99.95 for that car. You were going to like that car. No, Papa, you take it back. I don't want this car. Too big. Young man, baby, you are going to keep this car. That's all you're going to get. That's all there is. You enjoy that car. It got worse and worse and worse. Finally, the little boy took that car, to make a long story short, and smashed it on the ground. Parts flying all around. The little boy marched out of the house. He's not going to live here anymore. He's going to go to Grandma's house in New Jersey. He went outside, found his little tricycle, middle of winter, and he got his tricycle and began to ride his tricycle to New Jersey. <laughs> Father said, we're watching out through the window to see how far he'd go. He got to the curb. He smashed into the curb. Tricycle fell over. Smashed the tricycle. He got mad at the tricycle and kicked the tricycle. Now his foot is practically broken. Now he can hardly walk. And they watched this three-year-old boy begin to walk barefoot on the snow in his underwear, <laughs> going to New Jersey. And they watched about 50 feet. He looked back at the house. You could see him struggling. Turned around, came up the steps, rang the doorbell. Yes. Papa, it's cold out here. I know, baby, it's cold. Papa, my tricycle's broken. Yeah, I know, baby. Sorry. Papa, do you think the neighbors saw me in my underwear? <laughs> and the voice said, yeah, they're all probably, probably saw it. How could they help it? Daylight. Oh. He said, Papa, could I come home? <laughs> Scooped him up. He said, Yes, you can come home. This is your house, baby. This is always your house. It doesn't matter. You can always come home. This is your house, baby. The little boy said, is it my house even when I'm bad? He said, baby, it's even your house even when you're bad. This is your house. And the message of the Bible is God will say, heaven is your house even when we're bad. Amen? God bless you.